So thank you for everyone for sticking with us tonight. We, um, it allows us to have a little bit of hedging our bets tomorrow, uh, hoping that the weather uh, works well with us uh, tomorrow. Thank you for your patience that you've had and for um, your really encouraging and, and exciting participation uh, so far in the conference. So our next speaker is Dr. John E. Kelly. He is the president of the American Nuclear Society retired from the U.S. Department of Energy at the end of 2017. At DOE, he was the chief technology officer in the Office of Nuclear Energy. He was responsible for establishing the strategic technical direction for the research, development, demonstration, and deployment portfolios. Prior to assuming the duties of chief technology officer, he was the deputy assistant secretary for nuclear reactor technologies. He was responsible for the Civilian Nuclear research, Reactor Research and Development Portfolio, which included programs on small modular reactors, light water reactors, Generation 4 reactors, and radioisotope power systems for space exploration. In the international arena, he chaired the Gen 4 International Forum and the IAEA's Standing Advisory Group on Nuclear Energy. Prior to, to joining DOE in 2010, Dr. Kelly spent 30 years at Sandia National Lab where he was engaged in a broad spectrum of research programs in nuclear reactor safety, advanced nuclear energy technology, and national security. Dr. Kelly received his BS degree in nuclear engineering from the University of Michigan in 1976 and his PhD in nuclear engineering from the Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1980. Please welcome Dr. John Kelly. Uh, thank you, Wes, and it's a pleasure to be here, um, and thanks, thanks for uh, agreeing to stay for an extra 30 minutes or so to, to hear my talk, and I think it'll help tomorrow. I used to uh, come to NETS on a semi-regular basis when I'm, the meetings were in Albuquerque, or uh, lately uh, when I was at the Department of Energy, because uh, I had the radioisotope power sources uh, in my, my organization, so I've had the pleasure at this meeting now to get reacquainted with many of the my colleagues at NASA, JPL, and the other labs uh, who I've worked with uh, over the years. So, uh, hello everyone. So today, I I'm not going to talk about space. I'm going to talk about uh, terrestrial. And so this is a little different than maybe the theme of the meeting, but I think there's always, always good synergism to uh, have each of us talk to each other so that we kind of keep abreast of what's going on uh, in each of our spheres of influence. So today I'm going to talk about the perspectives on the future of nuclear power in the United States of America. Now, in June of 2017, President Trump visited the Department of Energy and gave a very powerful speech talking about the importance of nuclear and, the, and then ordering a complete review of our nuclear policy to ensure that domestic energy independence and to revive and expand the U.S. nuclear sector by preserving the current fleet and paving the way for advanced reactor designs. Uh, that study, that policy review, is not complete yet. I'm hoping that it will be completed in the next couple of months and at the ANS national meeting, we'll be able to share that uh, with the ANS members. Secretary Perry got the message really early on. Uh, he coined the phrase, let's make nuclear cool again. And he visited uh, uh, Idaho and Los Alamos and basically he makes the connection between the importance of nuclear for energy security and for environmental region, reasons. And so, uh, Secretary Perry has been very supportive of nuclear and made an important speech uh, earlier this week. However, there are <clears throat> many near-term challenges for nuclear power in the U.S. <clears throat> I think the biggest challenge right now is keeping the current fleet operating. Uh, low natural gas prices are putting a lot of pressure on the economics. We've been struggling with our new builds in Georgia and formerly in South Carolina. But if they come to, uh, the ones in Georgia come to fruition, maybe we can understand better the cost and schedule for the new builds. Uh, getting investment is difficult. These are 10, 10 to $15 billion projects, and it's really difficult to get that kind of uh, financing. And the grid is changing. As more intermittent renewables are put on the grid, this is changing how the grid's going to operate. So I think we need to anticipate the grid of the future. We still have waste management and no repository yet, although going back and forth on that one. And then um, uh, chief, you know, and, and one thing that's important is that 
when the U.S. exports nuclear technology to another country, we impose certain restrictions on it, and it's through those restrictions that we can satisfy our non-proliferation, safeguards, and security, and safety goals uh, when that other country accepts the, uh, the sale. Um, <clears throat> I think what's coming still is the uh, advanced uh, small modular reactor development, uh, and I'll talk a little bit about that, and then talk about what's going on in the, the world of Generation 4. So something that uh, Vic Reese and I uh, kind of worked up was looking at what, is, what does it really mean to decarbonize the electricity production in the U.S. And so the goal was set to do this by 2050, and you can believe all, or not believe all the, <clears throat> the, um, uh, what we hear today, but it seems to me that we can probably decarbonize electricity production in a manner that's economically affordable. So here's where we are today, and with, uh, this is the information from the uh, Energy Information Agency uh, which makes projections on the future of energy. Uh, data from 2010, which shows that we were at about, uh, clean energy was about 32%, and then uh, they project out to 2035, and it's at uh, about the same. So really, uh, it's not vectoring in the right direction. So what it really means, though, though, is we have to eliminate the sources of the carbon. That has to go to zero. We need to stop using petroleum, we need to switch uh, coal and natural gas from direct uh, release of carbon dioxide to the atmosphere to sequestration. And if you look at the numbers, um, these are my, my projections, not the EIA, but I looked at about a tenfold increase in renewables from where, where we are today. So from going from something on the order of uh, 200 terawatts to 2,000 terawatts by 2050. And then I said, well, nuclear maybe is a quarter of the market, and uh, fossil with sequestration is another quarter. So if you look at those numbers, what that shows you is that right now we're at about 800 uh, terawatts of nuclear. We need to get to about 1,600 or about doubling of our uh, nuclear capacity in the country. Now this result is, is uh, also been found by the Nuclear Energy Air Agency in Paris where they said worldwide uh, the amount of nuclear uh, power needs to double by 2050 in order to, to meet the climate change objectives. There's another way to look at it as well. Uh, right now, the U.S. has about 30% of all the reactors in the world, and that, that puts us in a leadership position, and, and we can actually be at the table and control the debate about safety, security, and all the other important attributes associated with nuclear energy. Uh, what that means, though, that if, if we don't do anything, we're going we're gonna to fall off and be replaced by China. And in order to keep it at about that uh, 30%, we need to add at about an additional 120 gigawatts. Again, about a doubling of uh, uh, nuclear power uh, going out to 2035 and beyond. So I, I, I created this little chart, it's real simple. Um, I'm not great at graphics, but uh, it shows on the bottom uh, the, uh, the lifetime of nuclear power plants based on their license. So the blue line is if they had a 40-year life. Well, most of the plants, about 80% 80, 80 of them now, have extended their lifetimes to 60 years. And so they moved to the red curve. And we now have, I think, three candidate uh, sites that are looking at extending that another 20 years through subsequent license renewal, perhaps out to 80 years. This is important because it buys us time for us to then make the investment to build up nuclear. Now, what is that mix going to look like? Well, I think advanced light water reactors, like we're building right now in South Carolina, and, or, sorry, in Georgia, uh, will still dominate the market. And that's going to probably be about 50%. But we're also looking at small modular reactors entering the market to replace uh, coal plants that will begin retiring in the 2030 timeframe. And so that's about uh, 25%. Then the final question is, what about generation four? So I've saved a little space there for them, about 25%. And the point here though is that if we we're gonna uh, try ever achieve that 25% for gen four, we need to be making the R&D uh, investments today in order for this to come in in a timely manner. Now, what's up with the current fleet? You know, the future of the nuclear industry is very dependent on keeping the current fleet operating. Uh, first, the revenues that drive the industry come from the electricity sales from the nuclear power plants. It, it therefore, has created a sustainability of the supply chain. So we have suppliers that can supply fuel and components, et cetera. And it leads to work, workforce development. The, the age of the nuclear, uh, in the nuclear industry is uh, pretty high right now, the median. It's by, uh, by, uh, bimodal distribution, um, but there's a, a look that, that, that says that you know, something like half 
of the uh, practicing nuclear engineer, uh, people working in the nuclear field will retire in the next decade. So uh, it's important for us to keep the current plants to uh, support workforce development. But in terms of uh, uh, the economics and things like that, it's a complex situation. Uh, we need to look at the market policies and structure. Right now, uh, uh, wind uh, and, and solar are getting production tax credits, and uh, states are setting renewable portfolio standards, and they're not including nuclear in the mix. Now, that's changing a little bit, but it's going to take time for that. But that imbalance allows a wind farm to be generating power at negative cost and still make money because they're getting this production tax credit. And that just goes against, against uh, uh, nuclear. Uh, utilities have gone to their state legislatures asking for support. So in New York, Illinois, and probably New Jersey, and uh, I'm hearing rumblings in Pennsylvania, that the state will come through and provide some incentives. Uh, the Nuclear Energy Agency has been stressing the importance of reducing operating costs. They set a goal of 30% reduction in the next five years or so. And the utilities are all working to achieve that. And then, as I mentioned before, this thing called subsequent license renewal, the 60 to 80 year, it's important that the utilities get it because if they can get that additional 20 years, they will make the investments in capital to keep the plants operating safely and securely and economically. At the same time, it's not always, always about the reactor. Uh, there's been some work being done in advanced fuels, especially since Fukushima, in what we're calling an enhanced to accident tolerant fuel. And the key here is to try to avoid two things. One is e either eliminate or greatly reduce the amount of hydrogen generation. And the second is, can we develop a, a fuel system that can withstand higher temperatures, giving us more time to cope with an accident? So DOE has three vendors working for them now, or working with them. Uh, Framaton, Westinghouse, and General Electric. And there's a, a whole set of different ideas from coatings on zirconium, the new cladding material, higher thermoconductivity fuel, and silicon carbide cladding. Now, in terms of the new builds, I think the question is, will the new builds be able to keep up with the retirements? Um, right now, they're not, and uh, so this is going to be an important question over the next decade. These are the first new reactor designs being built in 30 years. This is the AP1000 I'm talking about. Uh, and it's facing the challenges of first of a kind. Uh, Vogel 3 and 4, I was just down there uh, a couple weeks ago, talked to the CEO, and he tells me they're on track, and I saw the president uh, of the company also uh, was quoted this week on that same subject. And so they're looking at a 2021, 2022 uh, startup for, for one unit and then the other. Unfortunately, the VC summer plant was canceled uh, last year. Now, there are challenges for new nuclear development de deployment. Uh, it's high capital cost. Electricity demand has never rebounded since the recession. Low natural gas prices, and I, I talked about some of the market structure issues. So these are putting back pressure on uh, nuclear. <clears throat> now turning to SMRs. This is a collage we um, got from the um, uh, International Atomic Energy Agency, where they define uh, SMRs to be less than 300 megawatt electric. Uh, when I was at DOE, we used that same kind of uh, number for the um, you know, the power level, but we also looked at uh, factory fabrication as being an important attribute. Uh, and some reactors can be under 300 megawatt electric, but the, you cannot make them in a factory and ship them to the site. So that's the distinction we are making. And you can see that the designs are, are coming out from around the world, from Russia and China, and from um, Korea, US, etc. Now, as I mentioned, to us, factory fabrication was going to be important. Uh, something similar to what we see in uh, the Naval Reactors Program with the aircraft carriers and submarines and how they're actually uh, uh, produced. There we go. It's on now. Um, if you go to the factory fabrication, uh, this can reduce the on-site construction. Things can be uh, shipped and then assembled. It, it, and the smaller the units, it makes it more flexible. So this is why, when I talk about replacing coal plants, uh, coal plants and, and some of these SMRs are about the same size in terms of power output. And if, as the coal plant is decommissioned, 
if the nuclear plant could be put there because of the smaller emergency planning zone, things like that, then it's quite possible to build, to tap into the infrastructure, the electric power grid that's already there, and this could be a big uh, substantial savings. Um, it'll, these allow for modular expansion, lower capital cost, therefore a faster return on investment, and I see both uh, interest both domestically and internationally. Now currently, uh, there's three projects going on. Uh, one is New Scale, which is a, a firm that's in Oregon. And uh, they submitted their design certification application uh, back in January of 2017, about two years ago now. Uh, NRC accepted it and docked it. And uh, the review is taking place with the uh, approval expected in the uh, 2021 timeframe. And all readings from, that I've gotten from my NRC colleagues is that things look good and uh, they may be even a little bit ahead of schedule. Now, New Scale has teamed with what's called UAMPS. It's the uh, Utah uh, Associated Municipal Power uh, Suppliers. It's a group of utilities kind of in the Wyoming, Seattle, uh, Wyoming uh, Utah, Idaho area <clears throat> that, uh, that work together to uh, uh, provide uh, sustainable uh, electricity for their customers. So the, uh, the UAMPS team came to the Department of Energy and asked, could they get a site agreement to use land on the Idaho National Laboratory site? Uh, we reviewed that, made, had some discussions, and eventually we agreed to the, giving them that, that site uh, permit. And then they, uh, they were given four choices uh, at the Idaho National Lab, and they've picked one, and that's sort of the baseline right now. Um, and then the, the third project is at the Tennessee Valley Authority. Uh, they are taking the path of getting an early site permit where they kind of bounded the uh, environmental effects of uh, small modular reactors looking at the four U.S. designs. And they submitted their application about two years ago and it, uh, should be getting uh, that permit approved, I think, within this next year. They have not yet made a technology selection, so they still need to, to figure out which uh, technology that they actually would want to build. And this is at the Clinch River site, which at one time was to be the site of a, a fast breeder reactor. And then over the last year or so, maybe two years, there's been a growing interest in what we're calling microreactors. Um, these are range from very small up to 10 or maybe even a little bit above that megawatts, where small modular reactors are in the you know, 50 to 300 and elder, uh, larger are at the 1,000 megawatt range. But there's this in-between range, <clears throat> or smaller range, that could provide reliable and secure power to defense facilities, uh, supercomputers, a whole host of ideas are, are out there right now in terms of how microreactors could enter the market. Uh, certainly there's remote areas of the world that are not right now using diesel generators to generate their electricity. That's pretty expensive. And so the competition actually changes uh, depending on where you are in the world. <clears throat> and uh, thanks to Los Alamos, I was able to borrow one of their slides that talked about uh, something that I, I was briefed on a couple years ago to, called Megapower. Uh, and I think you've heard about uh, Krusty and all that if you were earlier in the day. But basically, it's using a similar thing. We have a, a reactor, a heat pipe technology to extract the heat to then to the, uh, uh, the, the uh, Brayton cycle in this case. Um, the idea here was could you, could you come up with a design that you could ship uh, anywhere in the world and then extract it uh, in something on the order of uh, 100 days or so uh, if, if you were at some uh, 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 base outside the continental U.S. So uh, lots of interest right now, especially from the Department of Defense in microreactors. And now let me turn to Gen 4. So this, this graph is uh, something we made up at DOE. Um, where we, we called the first generation, the, that were the, the early prototypes, generation one. The reactors that are operating today are the generation two. We're building generation three, and generation four is, is still in the R&D area, although there is some effort around the world in getting to the demonstration phase. Now, in terms of uh, reactors such as AP1000, there, there's four units in China that have come online and are producing power. And now, now we have the two in uh, Georgia. So we're hoping that the the, the, that early, um, uh, the, the first of a kind kind of issues can be uh, uh, basically dealt with through, through that construction. But I think the important thing about Gen 4 is that they're at much higher temperature than water reactors. 
And as a result, you could begin to think about non-electrical applications of the, for the heat that's produced. And this could range from uh, uh, hydrogen production or desalination, various chemical processes, and this would actually help to decarbonize much more of the carbon releases that we have today uh, if you can get into those industrial applications. Now, if you're interested in Gen 4 technology, uh, we created a webinar series, and uh, we're, still, we're still broadcasting those, we're still producing them. Uh, if you go to the website, uh, www.gen-4.org, uh, all the webinars have been archived, and they're basically uh, about an hour long by a professional from uh, all around the world uh, that speaks about a particular Gen 4 technology or related areas. And so if you're interested, you can go there and, and uh, get the latest and greatest on uh, the Gen, Gen 4 concepts. And they're also connecting with other uh, nuclear education organizations around the world uh, to share information on uh, educational opportunities in summer schools. Now this is the six, uh, the six systems that in the beginning, uh, when Gen 4 started, there was well over 100. Uh, they had basically had to down-select to a, a, a manageable set of systems. And then these uh, systems allow for the R&D to focus on the, the critical areas associated with each of these reactor types. Uh, there's three fast reactor systems. There's sodium, lead, and gas-cooled fast systems. Uh, two high-temperature systems, a gas-cooled and a molten salt-cooled. And then a supercritical water, which is a sort of a combination of nuclear technology with current coal technology, which uses uh, supercritical uh, water. Now, what's been really interesting for oh, three or four years now has been the growth in uh, uh, commercial interest in uh, advanced reactor designs. Now, these are, I would call, vendors. They're not, uh, they're not utilities yet, but there are some utilities that are starting to show interest. But uh, again, uh, putting down in the uh, Gen 4 nomenclature, you know, you have several companies looking at sodium fast reactors, uh, as well as high temperature, but a lot of interest in the molten salt technology. Uh, lead fast reactors got Westinghouse and Gen 4 Energy and uh, gas fast reactor. Uh, currently, there's no U.S. Uh, 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 firm that's interested in the uh, supercritical water. That's something that's coming out of uh, Canada and China. Now, important for the gas-cooled reactor is the development of the fuel. And so a special fuel called Triso was uh, uh, developed, started in Germany, and then we've been uh, in the U.S. perfecting that using uh, both Oak Ridge and Idaho to do the developmental work and testing. But basically, it's a, a, a small kernel of, of uh, uranium, uh, uh, that uh, kernel that is then coated with uh, various uh, ceramic barriers to hold the fission products in. And then these are put in, as a figure on the, on the bottom right shows, into... Uh, basically, uh, uh, you know, balls uh, of, of carbon that um, uh, then are then uh, put into the reactor as the fuel. So this has been a very important development, and uh, it's almost complete. They haven't completed uh, all the PIE yet and uh, uh, safety testing. We also think, to have to think about, for the fast reactors, uh, the U.S. preference is to use uh, metallic fuels. <clears throat> uh, this has to do with... Uh, um, the, the, the safety uh, characteristics and the ability to get more effective uh, transmutation if you wanted to burn actinides. Um, <clears throat> you know, we, we were able to make this kind of fuel a long time ago, uh, but that capability has uh, disappeared, so we would need to recreate that. And it, it involves a, a, a variety of different uh, technologies, uh, and the work right now is being done <clears throat> at the Idaho National Lab on, on, this, uh, on this area. Now, for all of the advanced reactors, um, you know, new, t new technical capabilities are going to be needed. And the one thing that uh, I've heard a little bit talked about today was the, that most of these advanced reactors need high assay LEU. So this is uh, uranium that's enriched to less than 20 percent, but it's not the, what's being done today, which is more in the less than 5 percent. Various options for how we obtain that material. Uh, there's been talk of mining the used fuel at Idaho from the Naval Reactor Program, and there was a process in the past that was used to uh, extract the uranium. Uh, EBR2 used uranium fuel, so we could look at mining that. And we could look at developing an enrichment capability. Uh, Centris was uh, recently awarded a contract to uh, do a, a sort of a demonstration. And Urenco, I, I've read in the, in the press, is also uh, talking about how they could do it. The other thing is uh, we don't have uh, easy access to a fast spectrum test reactor. Uh, it's possible to use a, a Rus Russian reactor called Boris 60, 
Uh, the Japanese reactor, which we had planned to use, is called Joyo, and uh, it was shut down after Fukushima and still has not restarted. You need this to do materials and fuel testing for the FAST systems, but as well as for other systems where you want to do accelerated aging. So the project that's been formed is called the Virtual Test Reactor. Uh, the Idaho National Lab is, is leading that effort with the involvement of several other laboratories. And G. Hitachi and uh, Bechtel have just uh, been awarded contracts to support the design and, and cost estimate uh, for this uh, VTR. So in summary, <clears throat> You know, in my view, nuclear power must be a major source of our energy production to meet both domestic and global energy needs. We need to continue, first, the safe and reliable operation of the current fleet, then begin to deploy the SMR technology in the mid-2020s, keep tracking the interest in microreactors and see what uh, could be done about uh, accelerating their uh, uh, production and deployment. And uh, for Gen 4, I think we need to develop the technologies to the point for deployment in the mid-2030s, which means in the 2020s, we need to be serious about a demonstration uh, plant. So with that, I thank you for your attention, and uh, I probably have a few minutes to answer questions. Thank you. Well, I'm not an economist, but I feel that in order for nuclear power to be competitive, we need to address your challenge number two, competitiveness with gas. Uh, how do Gen 4 uh, reactors, how might they compete with gas on, on cost? Because it seems that that's at the heart of the matter. Yeah, so there's two things that um, uh, John Deutsch at MIT uh, chaired a panel. Um, it's called the Secretary's um, uh, Secretary of Energy Advisory Board, and they, they did a report on this. Basically, the capital cost of nuclear the target needs to be reducing it by a factor of two. And th the other part of that was that there needs to be a societal cost of carbon. Uh, carbon tax or some other type of thing has you know, been kicked around. But there is a cost of carbon to society. And if you can get to that reduction in the capital cost by a factor of two, then you're in you know, 10, 10 or 20 percent of natural gas. And when utilities look at it, they're looking at a portfolio approach. They want to balance their risk. They don't want to put all their eggs in one basket, per se. So they want to have a mix of renewable, uh, natural gas. And eventually, natural gas will, will if, if we believe its growth, will need a sequestration system, which will add to the cost of that as well. So I think uh, things need to evolve in our, in our energy policy. It's very slow, though. Um, but I think that it's possible to get the incentives in place that would make nuclear favorable in the market. <clears throat> yeah. Oh. <laughs> Hi, Carl, Seattle, Friends of Fission. Uh, about four days ago, I spoke uh, at a Sunrise Movement town hall, uh, and the message there for me was, you know, we need all zero emission technologies to beat climate change. And as part of that illustration, I talk about the IPCC special report on 1.5 degrees. Uh, is there anything in your plan that, that is really in conflict with the other goals in SR15 or in any way that, that conflicts with pursuing other zero emission technologies? No, I think, you know, right now nuclear supplies about 70% of our zero emission electricity in the U.S. Uh, so the thought of, of somehow shutting that down uh, is put, put, put us in the wrong direction. So that's why it's, keeping the current fleet operating is important. And then those plants are going to get old, so we have to be thinking about the investments for the future. Uh, we pay a lot of attention to the, the, uh, what's coming out of the, the, I guess it was the UN, um, and, uh, and now the European Commission is, is on board and supporting nuclear as clean energy. And we're trying to change the debate from renewable energy to clean energy and get that as more of the, 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 the norm in terms of uh, energy when we talk about it, because nuclear is certainly clean and um, it, it needs to be part of the mix. You talked about economics, which seems to be one of the one of the big issues we've always had with the nuclear industry. At the same time, of course, to get down to zero carbon emissions, uh, natural gas simply lowers it; it doesn't get rid of it, as you as you also pointed out. So, it seems like that the real issue is dealing with the economic side. And do you see the small modular reactors as being perhaps the the, the key to getting the 
the capital cost down as compared to the building the larger plants on site? And if so, are there policy things that need to be enacted now to try to help to move things in that direction? Yeah, so if you talk to New Scale, they're, um, you know, they're, they're, they've got pretty detailed cost estimates right now, but they're, 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 you know, dollars per kilowatt hour installed is about the same as the large, but they're, but they're smaller units. And so, you know, they're talking about a, a, a 12 units of 50 megawatt each, getting them 600 megawatt electric. Um, but you can, you can build that up over a decade, which really helps. Um, the other thing that's important from a policy perspective is uh, the production tax credits. So the large light water reactors have those if they meet certain criteria. And I, there's a push to extend that coverage to small modular reactors. Now, um, it turns out that, that UAMPS is a, um, a, a municipal organization, and so they don't actually pay tax. So a production tax credit would be, uh, you have to place, uh, you have to be a financial whiz to figure out how that would work. But I, I've been told there is a way to make that happen. Yeah, and I think, um, you know, there's only one uh, vendor available today. It'd be really nice for uh, somebody else like Holtec or Westinghouse or, or B&W to get in there to, to provide some competition in that area. see the, uh, the factor of two reduction in the capital costs being more a matter of the uh, fabrication in factories or a change in the design or a combination of those two? I think it's a combination. For the Gen 4, you're at higher temperatures, so you're going to be operating at higher efficiency, so there's a you know, lower, um, the, sorry, basically higher uh, uh, electrical output for, for, for same thermal output from the, because of the higher temperature. Um, I think, uh, you know, we, we haven't demonstrated it yet, but I think the factory fabrication, if you look at the Navy data, they show the learning over time and how you get about a factor of, uh, a factor two reduction in, in the cost from the first to the seventh of a kind. Uh, and this has to do with the learning and, and, and the measure they use is labor hours. So there's some real savings there. Uh, how you get all the way there, um, I think what uh, uh, the Deutsches panel recommended was to uh, do a competition where you have maybe five or six vendors, um, each given, given a chunk of uh, funding to uh, further the design, then do a down select and build one or two to actually get the hard data that, that would show that you could get those kinds of cost reductions. Uh, I think the metric for, for the selection would be who has the greatest chance of achieving those large cost reductions. Second question about the uh, market restructuring. Um, you know, there have been several egregious examples of uh, wind supplying power at negative uh, prices and still making a profit uh, and everyone else paying to, to uh, put their power on the grid. Is there much support for changing those? Um, those I, I, I argued that, it, that they should not drive the cost negative. They should, they should not get the production tax credit if they're driving it negative. Um, uh, and, but there needs to be a balance, there needs to be some policy, FERC needs to get involved. Uh, this is more of a, it's something that the Department of Energy really can't control directly, it's not a federal thing, it's more of a state and regional. Uh, so, um, uh, but we're seeing many states, because of the job loss that, and the loss of clean energy, are putting in incentives to keep the nuclear plants operating. So, we'll, we'll see how this all plays out. Went back there. <coughs> Dr. Zarkarim from New Scale. I just want to answer one of the questions, uh, comment one of the uh, responses. Uh, one of the uh, considerations be, uh, be behind the uh, small modular reactors is actually uh, it's a cheaper from the capital cost construction wise because yeah, when you, uh, when, uh, you are building the reactor, you are also have to consider insurance and the loan interests and those are for the small reactors with the incremental buildup of the next models are actually lower comparing to the uh, large ones. So, That's thanks. probably quite right. Um, yeah. Good. Well, there's no other questions. Uh, it's been a pleasure speaking with you and uh, 
have a great meeting, and if you catch me later in the hall, I'll be glad to talk to you some more. So thank you. We'll see you all tomorrow morning at 9 a.m. Thank you.